Just a bit of housekeeping because we are coming towards the, the end of the year. In some ways I almost wish that we started First and Second Thessalonians a bit earlier on in the year but we had so much to finish off with Revelation and we kind of got stuck in a really, really good place, didn't we? We, we went over a few weeks with the subject of heaven which um, I thought what a great opportunity. And so this is our third uh, study on First and Second Thessalonians and uh, we will have a break uh, this uh, coming Sunday evening because of the carols and then the final Sunday of the Biblical Prophecy series will be Sunday the 18th which will finish off this study. This uh, study I put together a few years ago and I'll be basically teaching this down in a Bible prophecy conference in Busselton at the end of January on a Saturday. And so what we're dealing with throughout this study is very dear to me uh, because uh, I think when we come to Bible prophecy, my first place that I would start would be Revelation and then the next place that I would go to is the books of Thessalonians. And I think once we have an understanding of these books, it helps us understand God's perfect plan. So we'll come to the Lord in prayer and ask him to give his understanding tonight. Yes, Lord, uh, we think of what you have said in your word, the prayer of the one who wrote your word and you inspired them was, Lord, open my eyes that I might behold wondrous things from your law, from your word, and I pray that that would be our heart tonight. Lord, that every word that is spoken, every word of God that is read, Lord, that we would understand it aright. But Lord, beyond that, I pray that it would not just be an intellectual exercise. Lord, not just an argument over rights and wrongs, but Lord, that it would have an impact on our lives. Ultimately, we, we know, Lord, that we study your prophetic word a quarter of it at the time it was written was prophecy at least we study it lord because it gives us a sense of urgency lord it helps us live for you in a greater way we believe 1 john 3 it's the hope that purifies this blessed hope lord that reminds us that you would come back at any time and Lord, when you come back, we want to be living for you. We want to be doing your will, and that is our heart. And this is what we keep in mind, Lord, as we study prophecy, biblical prophecy, in Jesus' name. Amen. I think it's important to understand in every book of the Bible, there's always a historical context and uh, to study the history behind the various books of the Bible, I, I love doing that. And I think it gives you a perspective. You don't always have internal evidence for the historical background, but there is a lot of information, accurate information, that shows us where books in the Bible fit in, what their purpose was, and who the people are involved with it. And when you come to First and Second Thessalonians, this is so, so vital. Just to give you an example tonight, I read uh, a few years ago a series of books that were basically a dramatised life of the Apostle Paul. And I love that because that helped you enter into the Apostle Paul's life and his journeys. But I remember when uh, the, the books were discussing First and Second Thessalonians and and Paul supposedly, as the book was dramatising, was writing back to the Thessalonians and, and basically pretty much saying, well, you've got it all wrong. You know, when I mentioned about uh, the man of sin, when I mentioned about the Antichrist, it wasn't for, for you to think about that he was going to be somebody in the future. I just wanted you to be warned about evil men that are against the Word of God. And I thought, how easy it is Yes, we need to consider the historical context, but we need to look at what the Bible itself has to say. And I believe as you study these two books together and realise their setting, it helps you understand the purpose 
that the Apostle Paul had in writing them as inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. I think we need to recognise that often as those who wrote Scripture were writing, they didn't always realise that they were writing Scripture. But nevertheless, God as the holy author was moving them as they wrote. Their personalities come out, but he was moving them as they wrote. And the Holy Spirit of God had a purpose in Paul writing to the Thessalonians, not once, but twice. And there was a reason for him writing to them because it has helped fill out and given us understanding of what God's future purpose is. These books make it clearer than almost any other except for Revelation, I believe, that there will be a rapture, a catching away, where we'll be caught up to be with the Lord and meet him in the air. Paul makes it very clear in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 4. He also makes it very clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, Behold, I show you a mystery, something that hasn't been revealed before, that we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So he is saying, I'm showing something that hasn't been revealed before and, and he was letting the Corinthians know about that. But also he's letting the Thessalonians know about it as well. I can imagine we read the account in Acts that when the Apostle Paul goes to Thessalonica and it still amazes me, he was only there for a matter of weeks, the Bible tells us. And with my imagination, and I could be completely wrong on this, but it, it, it follows through as you look at these books, he must have spent hours in that short time going through the scriptures and teaching them, showing them. And of course he would have uh, had pretty much only the Old Testament at that time. But he, he must have been answering their questions and the question must have come up amongst them, you, you see this by, by the context of 1 Thessalonians, what about the Lord's return? They would have heard of the promise that the Lord Jesus Christ would come back. And so Paul must have explained to them, well, you need to expect the Lord Jesus Christ to return at any moment. And so you can understand they would have responded to that. There was an urgency. The Lord Jesus Christ could come back at any time. And so therefore, the context of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 11, I remind you of this when he says to them, you need to lead a quiet life. In other words, he wasn't saying there that, uh, you know, you cut yourself off and become a monk or whatever, but he's saying, look, you need to be careful. You need to make certain that you mind your own business you need to make certain that you work, you continue on your life as normal, but at the same time, not running here and there and getting stressed out about the Lord's return, expecting him to return, living in the light of that, but still planning, still planning day by day, year by year. You know, we've already planned out the whole of next year, and you might say, well, that's planning too far ahead. The Lord Jesus Christ could come back tonight and I say amen to that but if he doesn't at least we've got next year planned out you know and so you can see the balance can't you in the, all of this you know as time goes on I wonder how long Lord before you return but we still live and we still plan and we still work but at the same time expecting the Lord to return so you can imagine him sharing the Lord's return with them and them being so excited about it. But obviously they had questions and, the, and these questions came back to Paul when he was at Corinth. And so therefore he writes this, this first uh, letter to them, the first Thessalonians is what we call it, in AD 52, probably a year after he'd visited. And he's just explaining to them in more detail because he can see that they had the wrong response, that they were confused about this and so he's, he's wanting them to know, wanting them to understand and the Holy Spirit of God was behind this, don't you think that? 
Aren't you certain that the Holy Spirit of God was behind this? Because just as they needed to know the truth, we need to know the truth. God intended it that way. And I would say beyond that, after he'd written 1 Thessalonians, obviously he heard that they had further questions. You see, he focuses on, mainly in, in 1 Thessalonians, he focuses on preparing yourself for the gathering, for the rapture. And then he tells them about the rapture in chapter 4. And then in chapter 5, he tells them that they will not go through the day of the Lord. In other words, they will not go through the tribulation. He makes it very clear in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But they still had questions. And there were still some that were basically refusing to work and they were relying on others because they were saying, well, the Lord's going to come back at any time. Let's not work. And so the Apostle Paul has to say something further to them and he explains more. And explaining more, it helps us understand what I believe that God wants us to know about. And so that is the background. And it's so important to understand that otherwise it doesn't make a lot of sense unless you understand the process of what is happening here. And so therefore, this is why I believe we put these two books together because they're dealing with the same issues, things to come, both of them. And the second one obviously follows on from the first one and they are basically in sequence in order of the events that will happen in the future. And this outline I just very briefly want to mention again so that you get the overview. I think sometimes understanding the overview helps us understand what is happening verse by verse. And that's why we always, when we do a book study, try to get the overview. Because there's a danger when you just take a verse here, a verse there, you may not get it in context. Always consider the historical context. Always consider the historical context. Always consider the background. So you're catching up with me now. It was right here in front of me on this screen. But just a reminder, we've, we've looked at this before. So always consider the greater context. And in this case, I believe we should consider First and Second Thessalonians together. So chapters 1 through 3 of 1 Thessalonians is dealing with, before the rapture, how we should live in the light of the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ could come back at any time to catch us away. Then chapter 4 is dealing with the rapture itself and then when you come to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and then going into the second book of Thessalonians, it's really dealing with events after the rapture. And I know this is my outline, but... I, I see it as something that helps explain what is happening. There is a general order with things. I don't think that God intended us to be left in the dark. I think if we go through this in order, we'll have understanding and it will give us encouragement. It will give us certainty. I think back to a few years ago there again as, as COVID hit, just the uncertainty amongst so many Christians. I heard it a number of times. Are we going through the tribulation? Is this where God's going to purify the church? And I remember saying to a number of people, no, it's clear in the word of God that we will be taken out before the tribulation. We'll be removed. We're going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as you consider this, this is the, the outline that some of you already have in sheet form. We have printed out a few more of those. And I wanted to leave this with you because if you have this as a reminder to maybe pull out every now and then, once you get the context of the two books together, once you get that, it will help you understand what is happening. Because what is confusing for us in some cases, that which is referring to the same thing uses different words. So we've already seen chapter 1 deals with waiting for the Lord's coming, what we should be doing, and we're talking about the rapture here. Chapter 2 is walking with the Lord as we expect the rapture. Chapter 3 is living 
whole unblameable lives expecting the Lord to come back at any time. Chapter 4 is dealing with the rapture and I just want to focus on this because when we use the word rapture, remember it is a Latin word and although it is not found in the Bible, it means to be caught up and we use that. When you say, well maybe you don't, but you might say, I'm feeling enraptured today and you might be saying, well I'm caught up in love with my wife. You're caught up, you know. And often I am. That wasn't just looking for an opportunity to say that. You know, and so we are caught up. And the word rapture means that, to be caught up. And that is mentioned there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Also meeting in the air, departure. Salvation in these books is not only used in the context of referring to our salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ where we repent, from our sin and trust in him as our personal saviour, but it's used in the sense of deliverance. And it will be a deliverance when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and we're caught up to be with him. In chapter 5, which we saw last week, the same thing with the tribulation, the day of the Lord, the day of darkness, the day of wrath, are all terms that refer to the tribulation time. And so it's important to understand that. Because there are many that would say, oh, the day of the Lord, what does that mean? Some people even think that it refers to, to the coming of the Lord. But you'll see by the context that uh, it is primarily dealing with the tribulation. The second advent, and f- for some you may not be familiar with that term, advent, advent simply means to come down to earth. The first advent was when? When the Lord Jesus Christ came back. Well, he came for the first time as a babe to the earth. The first time was at Christmas time, if we want to put it that way. The second advent is when he comes back to rule and to reign at the end of the tribulation time. The second advent is not the rapture, because the Lord Jesus Christ has not come back down to earth. We meet him in the air. And this will be made clear as we get into our study tonight. Chapter 2 deals with particularly the Antichrist, and in many respects it's a summary of the events from the time of the rapture all the way through the tribulation to the end. And uh, we will primarily be dealing with that next time we meet. And then chapter 3 is a reminder there again what we should be doing while we're expecting the Lord Jesus Christ to return at the rapture. And so we dealt with this last week, but it's just a reminder because if I don't touch on this briefly... It won't make sense with where we are going next because we will primarily be looking at 1 Thessalonians in chapter 5 tonight. Sorry, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians and chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is what you see here before you in this diagram. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 will only make sense to you as you read it and understand that it is referring to the day of the Lord, the tribulation. And what's important to consider here is the Apostle Paul is writing, considering the two groups. He's considering the saved, which is us. He's considering the unbeliever, the unsaved. So you think about this. What does the day of the Lord, what does the tribulation mean for us that are saved? Well, he shows us through, through this chapter in 1 Thessalonians ch- in chapter 5. He shows that for the saved, we will be expecting the day of the Lord's return. In other words, we will not be ignorant. We will expect that the tribulation will come. But don't get confused by that because we know that we'll be taken away before that. The problem with the Thessalonians is they were experiencing persecution and they were saying, are we in the tribulation? Are we in the day of the Lord? And so the Apostle Paul has to reassure them and he's saying, you're believers. You're you're not going to be in ignorance. You will know about the day of the Lord. You'll know about the tribulation, but you're going to be taken out before that. And so he's saying there, secondly, he's saying that we we are to, to watch, waiting for our deliverance at the rapture. That's what he tells them there. This is for the saved. He tells us that God has not appointed us to wrath, to the tribulation, but deliverance at the rapture. 
And he says that we are set apart, body, soul, and spirit, for the rapture of the Lord. That's what you find for the believer mentioned in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 5. But for the unbeliever, the day of the Lord, I'm talking about the tribulation, they will not be expecting the Lord to come back at the rapture, nor will they be expecting the tribulation. It tells us there that they will be saying peace and safety. They will be hoping that they will be able to bring about peace and, and safety in this world. But the Apostle Paul is saying for the unbeliever, when the day of the Lord comes, it's going to come as a thief in the night. In other words, they will not be expecting the rapture, nor will they be expecting the day of the Lord, the tribulation. And all of a sudden, they're going to be in the midst of this sudden destruction. There'll be no escape for them. It'll be a time of darkness. And they will not have expected that. And so it is very clear, this is what he is referring to. Very clear. And so as we come now to 2 Thessalonians... I want to remind you of this again. Do not take 2 Thessalonians by itself. It goes with 1 Thessalonians. If you're going to study 2 Thessalonians, study 1 Thessalonians first. A reminder, they go together. And so it's important to understand as we look at 2 Thessalonians what it is that the Apostle Paul is going to begin to talk to them about. And I just want to remind you here in bringing up this this uh, diagram before us, he has primarily dealt with the rapture in the first four chapters of First Thessalonians. He has dealt with the tribulation in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 5. And then in 2 Thessalonians and chapter 1, he's going to deal with the second advent. He's going to clearly show that the second advent, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to judge, when he comes back to rule after the tribulation, is going to be very, very different from the rapture. And I don't believe if you are honest in your reading of the scripture that you can see it in any other way because they are so, so different. And there is an order here, the rapture then the day of the Lord, then the tribulation, and then he describes the second advent. And then after that, in 2 Thessalonians in chapter 2, he goes back and gives an overview of that whole period, the tribulation time. And so it's important to keep that in mind. The rapture is not the second advent. And I believe he shows this uh, to us. Now, before us, as we look at 2 Thessalonians and chapter 1, I'm going to start reading right from the beginning because remember, the Apostle Paul, he, he writes to them, this is his second letter, and he's not going to start straight away with, uh, without giving a greeting. You know, he's not just going to drop in straight away with, with the important topics that he's going to be dealing with, i.e. the second advent and and, and with the tribulation time, particularly on, in the focus of the Antichrist that is to come. And so, starting from verse 1 of 2 Thessalonians in chapter 2, Paul, Silvanus, which is another name for Silas and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. I'm glad he doesn't come straight away to them and say, you haven't done what I told you should do. You need to work. He's going to save that a little bit later on. You know, you need to get on with life, but expect the Lord to return at the rapture. And so he says this in verse 4. So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. I don't think we understand the persecutions. I don't think we understand the tribulations that they were, were going through. And this is why they had thought that they were maybe in the tribulation time. And that has happened to believers down through the ages. Times are difficult. Are we in the tribulation time? And so then he continues on. 
verse 5, which is manifest, clear evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Now, when we were going through Revelation, we dealt with the difference between the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, which I believe is the same thing, which is primarily talking about the thousand-year reign of Christ, the, the kingdom on, on earth. And we dealt with the difference between that and the kingdom of God. John chapter 3, we're born again into the kingdom of God, obviously referring to God's spiritual kingdom. And so God has his spiritual kingdom, but never ever forget that ultimately there will be a literal physical kingdom, a thousand year reign of Christ, which is clearly shown to us in Revelation chapter 20 when we were looking back at that. So don't let that confuse you when he's talking about being worthy of the kingdom of God. He's not saying to them, look, you need to be worthy, you need to be ready for the thousand year reign of Christ to come. Though if the Lord Jesus Christ had come back at that time, it would have only been seven years away. But he says that to them. Verse 6, Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. In other words, there were people that were troubling them and, and the Apostle Paul was saying, they will go themselves through tribulation. And then he says this in verse 7, and sometimes in our reading, I, I do not like to criticise translations at all. Um, I believe we have very, very good uh, English translations and very, very thorough. And it is not in my business, although I do know uh, a bit of Greek and Hebrew, to, to be critical. My job is not to be critical of the, the Bible and to judge the Bible. My job is to take the Bible to help us understand it and apply it to our lives so that our lives are changed. So, but what it says here, and this is why I wanted you to stop and pause and think for a moment, verse 7, and to give you who are troubled rest with us. So he's saying there, I want you to be at rest because you are troubled, even as the Apostle Paul was, as he's writing from Corinth, there was a time that he was arrested and thought that basically he was going to be put to death at the Bema seat there in Corinth. I've seen that place. It was, it was close for him with, with what, uh, what was going to happen as far as the, the persecution that he experienced. But then he says this, and I do like in this case that the King James puts a, a full stop some, some versions will put a comma. Some will not have anything there because it shows us in the middle of what we have in this verse, there is a change. It's going from talking about being troubled presently, you know, and, and them needing rest, and then all of a sudden it's showing us with a full stop, and that's the way it should be in the Greek, that it's going on to a new subject. He's been talking about the trials that they're going through, but now he's going to come down to the important subject that they still are not clear on, he's going to talk about the second advent. They already know about the rapture, remember. He's already let them know some details about the day of the Lord, the tribulation. He's going to let them know more about that in the next chapter, 2 Thessalonians in chapter 2. So what you see here. It literally means where you have the word when. You probably have that in your translation. It means literally this will happen. This will happen. Probably at the time when some translators translated it as when, it probably would have been appropriate. But our understanding of when is probably a little bit different to what it might have been some time ago. So the Apostle Paul is literally saying, I want you to take notice, full stop, this will happen. This will happen, is what he's saying. You need to know this, Thessalonians. I'm going from talking about the tribulation that you're going through now, the trials that you're going through now, but I want you to know this. This will happen. You know about the rapture. You know about the day of the Lord. You know about the tribulation. But this will happen. The Lord Jesus, end of verse 7, the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his 
mighty angels. He's saying there's going to come a time the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Is he talking about the rapture? No, I do not believe he is because we'll see the context will be he's talking about the second advent. And we continue on. We go to verse 8. And I want you to think about this. I'm putting the responsibility back to each one of us to think about this it tells us at this coming it's going to be in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ I say to you does that happen at the rapture when we meet the Lord in the air he doesn't even come back down to earth is he going to wreak vengeance upon the earth no he's not so therefore it must be referring to the second advent when he comes back to rule and to reign that's when he will wreak vengeance on the earth that's when he will judge on the earth verse 9 these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the lord and from the glory of his power the lord comes back in all of his glory he comes back with everlasting destruction. He destroys all those who oppose him and are against him, including the Antichrist at the end of the tribulation time when he comes back at the second advent. And so it says there in verse 10, when he comes in that day, referring to when he comes back at the second advent to be glorified in his saints and to be admired. In other words, there will be great wonder this mighty God, this mighty Lord Jesus Christ coming back to rule and to reign at that day, at the second advent, to be admired amongst all those who believe because in the end it will only be believers that will be there initially in the kingdom because our testimony among you was believed. So can you see what he's saying there? And as you continue on all the way through, and I'll continue to read the verses and then we'll cross-reference some other passages in the scripture. Look at verse 11 and 12. He says, Therefore we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Verse 12, That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to remind you that we could stop there as we tend to do whenever we come to the next chapter. When I outline the scripture, usually I'm trying to outline chapter by chapter, but there's a danger in that because the chapters that we have in our current Bibles were only put there about a thousand years ago. Did the Lord allow that? Did he have his hand upon that? I believe he did. But was it inspired the way that it was done? Probably not, and yet I still believe this is God's word that he has a hand in it. It was done by uh, a Catholic monk at the time, um, Stephen Langton, we believe. And we don't understand, I think, also, as I said last week, that it was probably about another 500 years nearly later after that that the verses were finally put into the scripture as we know it. And I have some old Bibles and they're very, very hard to read because all of a sudden there is no John 3.16. There's just John chapter 3. And so you go through it, it's all there together and you think, where is John chapter 3 and verse 16? You struggle with it. And so we just naturally have got used to that and it's helpful for us. But sometimes it's a danger to us because we take verses isolated by themselves without considering the whole context. And so therefore, the Apostle Paul has talked about the second advent, the Lord Jesus Christ coming back in judgment. But he's still continuing on in chapter 2 and verse 1. He says, Now brethren, now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you. So he has told them about the second advent, made it clear for them, but then he says, now, I just want to remind you, you already know about the gathering together unto 
the Lord Jesus Christ. You already know about the rapture. We've, we've spoken about that. And then he goes on to explain that they are not to be troubled because the rapture had not happened. So what I want you to see as we, as we look at the diagram before us and then I want to cross-reference and we'll spend the rest of our, our time on this, I want you to see how clear this is that what is mentioned in 2 Thessalonians in chapter 1 is the second advent. Remember when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to rule and to reign. So you see this in verse 5 and 6, uh, particularly just uh, uh, moving on there a little bit, but you see that this, this is about judgment that is coming. He's talking about the ch judgment there that was currently, but he's also looking forward to the future judgment. You see, secondly, that when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back at the second advent in verse 7, that he will be openly revealed from heaven. All will see him. The Bible says every eye will see him. But at the rapture, only we as believers will see him. So you can see the difference here. In verse 8, he shows us there, thirdly, that he will come back in flaming fire. Judgment. He will take vengeance on, on the unsaved. This is clear. This has nothing to do with the rapture. We've said this before, but I'm sure when the rapture occurs, most of the world will probably not know that it has happened. I think all that they will probably realise is there's a lot of people disappeared. And I can imagine they'll make up all sorts of reasons for, for why there's the disappearance. But when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back in judgment at the second advent, everybody will see him. Because he comes back in judgment, he comes back in vengeance. And then fourthly, the unsaved will be punished with everlasting destruction. And you see that there in verse 9. These shall be punished with the everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Coming back in glory, coming back in power, and he will judge. Nothing to do with this wonderful, blessed hope of the rapture that we're looking forward to. They cannot be the same. And if that is the return that you are looking forward to, there is a problem. And so the glory of his power will be revealed and then, verse 10, he'll be glorified by his people and by believers. And for us, we're returning with him and we'll be part of the, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes to rule and to reign. Now, I've got a couple of cross-references that you'll see there before you. And uh, I want us to turn to these because it is just to reinforce what we see is described there by the Apostle Paul and 2 Thessalonians in chapter 1 referring to the second advent. And there are other parts of the New Testament that clearly show us about it. If you go to the little book of Jude, just before Revelation, you have the reference before you. I didn't need to put chapter 1, but that was just in case you were wondering what chapter it was. There's only one chapter. But I want us to read verse 14 and 15, and I want you to think about this. What coming is this referring to? Is this referring to the rapture? Or is this referring to the second advent when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back in judgment? So, verse 14. And it's interesting to me that Enoch, before the flood, knew about that there would be a coming of the Lord to earth in judgment. He knew about that. He didn't know about the rapture because it was a mystery that isn't revealed until 1 Corinthians in chapter 15. And 1 Thessalonians in chapter 4. So, so he says there, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, in other words, the unrighteous, ungodly men, also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. And I love that, because the ten thousands of his saints, in other words, innumerable saints, innumerable believers, that I believe is referring to us. Coming back with the Lord 
at the end of the tribulation, coming back with the Lord. And if we're coming back with the Lord, it means that we must have gone to be with him somewhere along the line. And we obviously went to be with him at the rapture, at the catching away. And what does the Lord do when he comes back? You can clearly see that he is referring here, the, the, the Apostle Jude is referring to the second advent, the Lord coming back in judgment, because it says there in verse 15, he's going to execute judgment on all to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him do you get a bit of an idea there that it's talking about how ungodly things will be and as we went through revelation we saw the ungodliness there didn't we and so therefore it makes sense the lord is coming back to judge all the ungodliness and we think things are bad now but as the tribulation commences after the rapture it's obviously going to get worse and worse and worse and so it is obviously referring there to the second advent the lord jesus christ coming back in judgment and the other passage that i want us to ret to turn to is is in revelation in chapter 19 and we dealt with this some weeks ago but i want us to see it is clear that what the apostle paul is talking about in second thessalonians in chapter 1 is the Lord Jesus Christ coming back to rule and to reign in judgment. And the description that he gives in 2 Thessalonians in chapter 1 is very much like the description that you have in Revelation 19, where the Lord Jesus Christ comes back there again with believers. We've been with him at our marriage to the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. We are the bride. We come back with him. That's the description he gives throughout this chapter. So if, once again, if we are with him and return with him, we must have gone to be with him somewhere along the line. And so you see this as we pick it up in verse 11 of Revelation 19 and follow along with this. Now I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. That's the description of what you see there in 2 Thessalonians in chapter 1. Judgment. Notice, his eyes were like a flame of fire. Similar description there in 2 Thessalonians in chapter 1. And on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with robe dipped in blood, a robe dipped in in blood and we saw uh, previously that that ties in with isaiah and how that when the lord jesus christ comes back at the second advent he will judge the world and the blood upon him is not his blood but it is the blood of the enemy so he's clothed verse 13 with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. Just in case there is any doubt about who this is, we have it clear here. He's the Word of God, the living Word of God. And we'll see next time we meet together that the Lord will judge with the Word of his mouth, even as it tells us here. The power of the Lord. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And I believe that's us because the context, as you go back even previous to this, shows that it is referring to believers, the saints coming back with him, followed him, notice, on white horses. Now out of his mouth, verse 15, goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. Judgment, judgment, judgment. And I don't say that in a, in a loving way, I say that in a sad way. Judgment will occur against all ungodliness. And he himself will rule them, notice, with a rod of iron. There is going to be judgment, judgment. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, just in case you're still doubting, King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord of all lords. King of all kings. The only one. 
Then, verse 17, I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all people free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the Antichrist, the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him, against whom the Lord Jesus Christ, who sat on the horse and against his army, then the beast, the Antichrist, was captured and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. Judgment against the ungodly. Judgment. Oh, brethren, this is not the rapture. This is not our gathering together. In him. Our gathering together unto him is all going to be about being united with our, our wonderful loving Lord in his presence. Joy in his presence. Revelation 4 and 5 is the, the joy that comes from being in his presence as we are caught up to be with him. Then we're in his presence and there's rejoicing in heaven. This is nothing like that. The Lord comes back to judge and to rule. And he wants the Thessalonians to know about that because he does not want them to confuse that, I believe, with the rapture that he's already talked to them about in 1 Thessalonians and chapter 4. I trust by God's grace with what we've been able to offer tonight that it has been made clearer to you that I do not believe we are in a doubtful position. I do not believe that it is difficult to defend our position. We come to this position because we take it chronologically, we take it in context, and I believe anybody who reasonably understands the scripture as a believer, this should be the conclusion that you would come to uh, because this is the way that I believe it is laid out for us. Let's pray. O oh Lord God, as we come before you, thank you for reminding us of our blessed hope. Lord, thank you that there was a group of believers at Thessalonica. They got some things confused. They stopped working. They stop focusing on living for you, but Lord, thank you in many respects, Lord, that they were struggling with that because you use that for your glory to allow a man called the Apostle Paul that you revealed things to, revealed your word through him so that he could write to them and explain about the rapture. Explain then about the day of the Lord, the tribulation, but then explain also about the second advent, all in order we see here. Thank you, Lord. And so therefore, thank you, Lord, that it should not leave us in any doubt. We expect you at any time at the rapture. We expect to be with you at any time. And we know according to your word, not only here, but in Revelation, that the tribulation will, will come after we're caught up to be with you. And then will be your coming back down to earth in judgment. Thank you for your precious word. In Jesus' name.